the book of Acts. And turn, if you want to, in your Bibles to Acts chapter 11. The message will be up here also on the PowerPoint. But in Acts chapter 11 is where we are. We're concluding this chapter this morning. Acts chapter 11. And we'll be looking at biblical giving in the age of the gospel of Christ. So we got some instruction we'll be giving this morning. It's not going to be in how you can empty all your pockets into the church offering. All right. Let you know right ahead. That is not what the message is about this morning. You emptying your pockets. We're not going to pass the offering bag three times this morning. Okay. We won't even pass it once. It always just stays on the table. As the Lord presses upon your heart, you give. Okay. But uh, the message applies to the time that we are living in now. The rapture is not far away. When all God's saints across the world are all going to be raptured out of this world and the seven-year tribulation period starts. And things are happening around the world. And we as God's people, knowing what's taking place. Now, we don't know when the rapture is going to take place. We don't have the date. But we have enough evidence around us to know that what is going to take place in the area of the world economy uh, the world's wars. Yeah, we have war taking place already. We have countries sort of used to, used to say, you know, waving their sabers, but now it's waving their cannons or whatever, or, or actually it's flying their what? Drones. <laughs> okay. Oh, okay. So we know what's happened. And Jesus said in the last days there will be wars and what? Rumors of wars. Okay. So as we get into the message this morning, biblical giving in the age of the gospel of Christ, which is the age that we are in. And here's the outline for the passage this morning, short outline. The Antioch church sent a message, or is sent a message from God. God's message is, I'm sending a worldwide famine. Now, as we know, who's in charge of the climate? The Lord. The Lord. God's in charge of the climate. Okay. And then thirdly, Antioch individual believers help the Judean brethren. Now, when we get to our application, I want you to have, usually I don't share this in the beginning of the message. We wait till we get through the, the heart of the text and then we get into the application. But I want you to think of the application before we get there. Why are Antioch believers helping Judean believers when the famine is a worldwide famine? Aren't they going to need help too? It's just not a local Palestinian one. It's also for the, it's a worldwide one. So won't the Antioch believers need help too? Okay, so here we go into the message this morning. First point, the Antioch church has sent a message from God. Acts 11, verse 26. And when he had found him Saul, he brought him unto Antioch. Now that is, uh, Barnabas went looking there because the church is really growing. Many Gentiles have become Christians at Antioch. And Barnabas needs help in teaching. And he went and found Saul over in Tarsus. And it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and they taught much people. And the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. Now the church in Antioch up there is really above Jerusalem. It is really growing. God is blessing it. I mean, there are some Christians there on fire for the Lord. They're excited about their newfound faith in the true God, not an idol, but in the true God. And things are really happening and many are coming into the church. And now in verse 27, and in these days came prophets from Jerusalem unto Antioch. So here come some prophets. These would be Jewish prophets. And everybody down in Jerusalem and Judea is hearing about these blessings that are taking place up there. But God has a message he wants to get to the Christians there in Antioch in this church. Here we are. And there stood up one of them named Agabus. And he signified by the Spirit, so Scripture lets us know very clearly, this isn't something he's made up. This is from the Lord. And he signified by the Spirit that there should be great dearth, that is famine children, is what that word means, throughout all the world, which came to pass in the days of Claudius Caesar. Okay? So there is going to be a famine. Now when it says all the world there, to people living in the Roman Empire, that was the world. Okay, so that may be exactly what it's just simply referring to is that throughout the empire of the Romans, that is where there's going to be this great famine. So it's just not a Palestinian famine. Realize that. It's the one that's a great famine taking place everywhere. Okay. 
And then the disciples, every man according to his ability, determined to send relief unto the brethren which dwelt in Judea. Wait a minute. If it's going to be through here again, it's coming our way, it's coming to Antioch. Oh, we got to think of ourselves. Those poor Judean brethren down there, they're going to have to figure out how they're going to take of their, themselves, right? Isn't that way some people think? Yeah, but no, what's the brethren doing? The brethren in Antioch are thinking, oh boy, those poor Judean brethren down there, we got to help them. Yeah, we got to send relief down there. But notice it says here, every man according to his ability. So for all the people within the church, each person is going to, you know, okay, Lord, what, do you, what could I help out? How, how could I send some down there? How, how much do I give? Oh, I've got a couple cows over here. I'll sell one of them, you know, extra and, you know, and, sell, and send that money down there to help out. Or maybe somebody could take one of those cows down there, man. She's, you know, if they can find some feed for it, they'll have plenty of milk. Okay? So various different ways they could send relief. Just not in the area of money. Okay? Verse 30 says, which also they what? They did. So what they were thinking about, they did. And they sent it to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. So Barnabas and Saul have been ministering there in the church. And so now they give them this money and say, guys, would you take it down? Take these gifts down. Okay. And so they are going to relieve the brethren down there. Okay. So there's the basic text for our message this morning. Okay. So now... Application again. Why are Antioch believers helping Judean believers when the famine is worldwide famine? How come the Judean believers aren't sending help to them? It's going to be worldwide. We may need help up here in Antioch. Why aren't we getting something from them? Why are we sending it? Can you see somebody in the church saying that? If it's going to be worldwide, we're going to need some help. Why are we going to send it down there? Why did you two prophets come up here? <laughs> yeah. Uh, Jewish prophets. I know about Jewish people. Uh, yeah. You're after our money, huh? Can you see people thinking like that? Okay. There's a lot of, yeah. I'm thinking of some humor I used to know before I became a Christian, but I won't share it. Okay. Yeah. I love the Jewish people. I love the Jewish people. And many of it, much of it is false anyway, those stories and jokes, so to speak. Won't the Antioch believers need help too? And the answer is naturally yes. But why are they going to send help? This is why. The Judean believers are destitute. That's what you got to know. The Jewian believers down in Judea, in Jerusalem, the believers are destitute. Why? Very first chapter, I mean, second chapter of Acts. We've read that a few weeks ago, a few months ago. And all that believed among the church, you know, there in Jerusalem, it was a practice that was taking place throughout Judea, not only in Jerusalem, but to the Jews. All that believed were together, had all things common. They sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. Now let me show you this. God did not tell them to do that. I want you to think. God did not tell them to do that. Had the church in Antioch done it? No. Every man gave according to his what? Ability. So had they gone out in Antioch and everybody sold all their things and pulled it all together and now they had a commune and they were delivered. See, so many growing up in, in, uh, in America, uh, there are so many religious communes. Different people in different places throughout America. There's, you get these religious communes. We all got to get together. We all sell our goods. We all get together. When I was in university, and I was the president of the Christian Club for three years. I mean, three semesters. And, uh, yeah. and I had guys doing that and girls doing it. Oh, Rick, I'm going to go join this commune. I'm going to you know, be a part of it. Why? <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Then I knew people who came... In a commune, came out of these Christian communes, and they said, oh, man, it was awful in there, right? I mean, they want you to do this, they want you to do that, they want you to do it. Yeah, yeah. And I think some of you have heard me tell me, being that I was the Christian, uh, uh, pres the president of the Christian club on campus, the communist 
it was a communist club, and the communist people would come to me, and particularly this one guy all the time, wearing his little red star all the time. You know, he said, you know, you, you are Christians. You should be a part of our communist party. Yeah, we share everything. You know, he'd quote, he knew Acts chapter 2. Oh, you got to you, you share everything. Yeah. <laughs> Let me share with you guys. And young people, listen to me. You cannot be a communist and a Christian too. There's no such thing as a communist Christian. Now, some of you may disagree with me. But communism, if you read the Communist Manifesto, communism in Karl Marx, there is no God. Now, remember that. Communism has no God. It's, and it's a paradox to say you're a Christian and a communist. Because communists, the state is God. And there's nothing higher than the state, right? If you know communism. You serve the state and you live in the state. And the state determines how and what and where you will do your jobs and your work. That's communism. But our children, are they being taught it? Pick up back there on our table. We have the Marxist culture that's hit Australia. Marxism, communism is running through our society. Western worlds, okay? You cannot be a communist and a Christian. Mark that down. You just do a little bit of research and you'll come back. And look what's happened to the countries of the world, in the Western world, where the Marxist philosophy has gone into the societies. Look at South America, right? Look at Venezuela. I have a brother in the oil industry. We just retired, excuse me, retired too. But he used to go to Venezuela a lot, worked for a big oil company. But man, the last time he was down there, he thankfully he got out. <laughs> okay. Oh, the country's falling apart, right? And Venezuela, what's taking place there and what's moving? I can remember as a kid going into Mexico. We used to go from Southern California, Los Angeles, down into Tijuana and go down to Mexico. And one day we were going down there. I think this is one of the times when Anita and I uh, we're taking our kids down there to Tijuana. And as we were going across the border, we got a yellow taxi, famous. Anybody remember Tijuana Brass? Yeah, yeah the old song, Tijuana Taxi. And you're going across the border into Tijuana, Mexico. And we had to stop. We were in a taxi. Because here you can see all the flags. The red flags and the arm and sickle. Marching down. We had to wait for the parade of the Communist Party going through Tijuana, Mexico. Okay. So being people, you'd hear about the drug dealers, right? Communism reaps in South America and the control it takes in people's lives. Well, let me share. I'm sharing you. God did not tell the Jewish people in Judea after Christ went back to heaven to do this. They did it on their own. Because one thing is, what are they full of? They're full of the love of the Lord. The love of the Lord is in their hearts. They have compassion for each other. And so what do they do? They start just, hey, it's not mine. We realize that. It's not mine. It's the Lord's. Let's minister to each other. And by the way, Marcus, the Lord's coming back real soon. He's going to be here real soon. He's coming back real soon. So we'll just sell everything and he's going to set up his kingdom. Okay, let's read on. Application. So why did the early Jews believers sell everything and share it between themselves? Well, their focus was on the kingdom being restored. They thought the kingdom, not only is the love of Christ controlling them, but they thought the kingdom was going to be restored right away. So they had, their focus was on the kingdom being restored. John the Baptist, did John the Baptist, what did he preach? Repent for the what? The kingdom is at hand. What did Jesus preach? Repent. Also, he came preaching that the gospel of the kingdom of God is coming. What did the disciples preach? We'll, we'll read the verses here. Mark 1, 14. Now, after that, John was put in prison. That's John the Baptist. Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. And then Jesus sent out his disciples. And what did they preach? And he, Jesus, sent them disciples to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. The whole message was the kingdom is coming. The kingdom is going to be set up. Thus repent. And that was the message. Because in the Old Testament, that's what the Jews were looking for constantly. is for them to be the nation of the world. God's chosen people to proclaim him to the whole world. A special kingdom of people of God. And now they're under who? The Romans, right? 
the Romans are ruling them and they're going to be set free from the Romans and the Messiah will set up his kingdom and they will again be the kingdom of representing God in the world with the Messiah, God the Son there. That's what they're looking for. That's what they're thinking is going to happen. Okay? Read on here. Uh, why did the early church, Jewish church, sell everything and share it between themselves? They asked Jesus if now was the kingdom time after he rose. That after Jesus rose from the grave, showed himself for 40 days, he's about to go back into heaven. He's speaking to the disciples there in Acts chapter 1. Let me follow, follow me from verse 6. And when they therefore were come together, they asked of him Jesus, saying, Lord, will thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? See the focus of the mindset. You got to understand the mindset. To the Jew, the kingdom's coming. The kingdom's coming. Jesus has just died on the cross. He's risen. He's alive. But they don't understand the fullness of the reality that Christ died to deliver them first from what? Their sins. To give them forgiveness of sins. Now, they understood what sin was. They were Jews. They knew the law. They knew what sin was. Okay. And now they have Christ in their lives. Okay. But they still, the penny hasn't dropped yet that the focus is you need Christ and the world needs Christ in their hearts and lives. They need forgiveness for a sin. And so they ask Jesus that question. What does Jesus say then? Yeah, I'm going to restore the kingdom. No, what did he say? And he said to them, it is, now, is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has put in his own power. So don't worry about that. Now verse 8. Oh, let me read the uh, application again. So why did the early Jewish church sell everything and share it between themselves? They were not listening to Jesus' instructions. So don't worry about the kingdom. That's in the Father's hand. But guys, hear what I want you to do. But ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and unto the other most part of the earth. So were they listening to what Jesus said? We got to go to the other parts of the earth. Isn't that what Jesus said to him? He said, would you sell everything you have to go to the other parts of the earth? Would you sit back and say, oh man, that plane ticket's going to cost me this much. I'm going to have to, you know. Yeah, but, but everybody's, daddy, everybody's selling everything. But Jesus said, I heard him. I was there before he, he said, he, we got to go to the other parts. We got to tell everybody in the world about him. Oh, but daddy, everybody's selling everything. Yeah, aren't you going to do the same thing? Sell every. How can I sell everything and still go to the other parts of the earth and tell everybody about the gospel? Here's one reason why I think they didn't understand or they forgot what he actually said. Verse 9. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld him, he was taken up. So at the same time Jesus is telling them about the Great Commission again to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He starts to rise in front of them. He starts to go up. And a cloud received him out of their sights. So in Awana, in our youth programs on Sunday night, we've seen this picture many times, right, you leaders? Okay. Yeah, there's Jesus. Hey, right, Cody, you've seen that picture several times? Ah, uh, he's going, to, okay. He's going up. Jesus is there telling them. He just told them, yeah, you got to go into all the world. And here he starts going up into the clouds. And then right after he goes in the clouds, what appears? Two, two, angels. two angels. Yeah, the two angels say, hey, man, why are you looking up in the clouds? The same Jesus who went up in the clouds. He's going to come back. At the... Wow, in the same manner. And the scripture says how they are in their white robes. Yeah, okay? Their brilliant brightness, their whiteness. Yeah. So that would, would that captivate your mind for a while? To actually see all that? And can't you imagine them walking back, you know? Yeah. Wow. Luke, Luke got it down in Acts chapter 1 there, what Jesus said. But so many of them, he went up for her eyes. But see, guys, let me show you. You come to church on a Sunday. Same thing. As a pastor, I stand here. I show you God's word. Okay, I did my duty. I go home. And what do you do? You forget what you heard. Then later, I've had people come to me and say, who in some of the churches we've been in over the years, or go back to a church to visit. And somebody says, you know, Pastor Rick, 
I remember you preaching on this and that. I now know what you were saying. <laughs> oh, yeah, but it's true. Spiritual truth. Yeah, line by line, little bit by little bit, here, little here, little there. It takes time. We all have to grow. And so much of the church didn't understand what Jesus meant when he said, we've got to go into all the world. Remember when Peter went over to find out, Peter and John, to find out what was happening in Samaria with Philip the evangelist, how people were getting saved. And it says they passed through Samaria. Did they preach to anybody? But did Jesus tell them on the day he rose, you've got, your Holy Spirit will come upon you and you shall be witnesses unto me to who? Jerusalem, Judea, the Samaritans. And it wasn't until after they got over and saw the grace of God on the Samaritans coming to Christ that says that, that when Peter and John then went back to Jerusalem, what they do? They preached to the Samaritans, but they didn't do it on the way. You see, prejudice, when we have prejudice, like the Jewish prejudice was so strong, you know, Jesus was always counteracting that. And we see how it's so real still after they come to know Christ. That's why Christians, we got to stay so humble. You probably have prejudice in, every, in various areas of your life and you don't really realize how much prejudice you really have until you really get challenged by the Lord to go and be a witness for him, to go places you've never gone, to look at people in ways you've never looked at them before. Everybody is just a soul, a soul that Jesus died for. And our job is to show the love to those souls, no matter who they are, what they are, where they are. And so why did the early Jewish believers sell everything and share it between themselves? Their focus was not on the gospel of Christ. They were looking at the gospel of the what? The kingdom. But they weren't looking at the reality why Christ died on that cross. More than to set up a kingdom one day to save every soul in this world from their sin. Sin takes us to hell because we have not acknowledged we needed our Savior to save us from our sins. Romans 1.16, here the Apostle Paul says, For I am not ashamed of the what? The gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, even to the Jew, guys. Okay? He's like, you know, man, Romans is, a, is, the, is the book on salvation. And yeah, right and right, he says, Now you guys listen careful to this gospel. Okay? The gospel of Christ. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. Now, there's just some of the places. I'll give you Romans 15, 19, 1 Corinthians 9, 12, 2 Corinthians 4, 4, Galatians 1, 6. Go to Galatians 1. You've got your Bible there. I haven't got it there. But go to Galatians 1, 6, and 7 just for a moment. You've got your Bible there? Turn to Galatians 1, 6, and 7. And here, Paul, throughout his epistles, he keeps emphasizing the gospel of Christ. And here in Galatians, to the churches of Galatia, he says in verse 6, I marvel... Galatians 1, verse 6. Okay, I marvel not that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. Okay? And this is the problem, Galatians. You know, the Judaizers. Who had caused a big problem? The Judaizer Jews who came and said, you have to keep the law to be saved. And Paul says, you're going after another gospel. Because those Judaizers, what is the gospel they've got? The gospel of the kingdom. They're proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom. If you're going to be a part of the kingdom of God, you've got to do what? Keep the law. That's why they had a different gospel. And Paul says, you've gone after another what? Gospel. They've taken you from the gospel of Christ. Okay. Which is not another. Look at verse 7. Which is not another. But there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. In the church age we're in, we're in the gospel of Christ. We're not in the gospel of the kingdom. That's to come. And that's what, during the tribulation period, that's what's going to be preached. Because the 70th week of Daniel takes place during those seven years. And that is centered all around who? Israel. The 144,000 Jews will be preaching the gospel of the kingdom because the Messiah who died for their sins will be the message they preach. The Messiah came and died for your sins and he's coming to set up the kingdom. And that is the message that will fade. And then they're all going to be killed. Those of you who know a bit of Bible prophecy, if you've been following us on Wednesday night, we've been going through Ezekiel. 
And you know, halfway through, the 144,000 will be killed. The two witnesses in Jerusalem, they're going to be killed. Uh, yeah. And then, who preaches the gospel? Angels. Go to Revelation 14. Angel flying through, preaching. And it says it's called the everlasting gospel. This is the good news that has always been out there. God, from the beginning... Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, we saw in Sunday school this morning. Where did the scarlet thread start? Right there in the garden. He'll bruise his heel, but he will bruise your what? Head, he says to Satan. Crush it. And so, yes. So here we have the gospel of Christ. Romans 2, 16. In that day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according. And notice what Paul says. What's the last two words? My gospel, my gospel, okay? See, Paul got it clear. Even the apostles themselves that walked with Christ, he was an apostle, Paul, but he was, came afterwards, okay? But they consistently were preaching about Christ, preaching that he's salvation, and everything's clear there. But their focus did not understand of taking the gospel to the world. And they were still so Jewish centered because centered because of their heritage. And brothers and sisters, in these last days, you've got to be make it. Which are you? Are you a citizen of heaven first or are you a citizen of this world? You've got to have to you've got to make choices. You're going to be called to make choices. And when you say you're a citizen of heaven first, of the kingdom, of the glory of God and the kingdom that's going to be set up, yeah, you're a heavenly part of the church of Jesus Christ. You know. You're going to be called upon who is the Lord of your life and, uh, in these last days. Yeah. And many Christians already around the world you are suffering. And uh, those that are standing up saying, yes, my allegiance is first to my Savior and to no one else. No one else. There we have in the chart there. Now, these, those of you that are, are regulars here know that this seven, the seven dispensations, we are a dispensational church. So few churches now are dispensational. I don't know of any of the Bible colleges now here in Australia that are denominational Bible colleges, like, say, the Baptist Union. All of them are amillennial. They're not dispensational. And so many dispensational churches that were dispensational with the new pastors, the old pastors were dying out, new pastors are coming in. And I've been told, I get people call me up because I'm the, the rep for Western Australia for the Herald of Hope ministry. I get people calling me and saying, Pastor Rick, we used to have a pastor here in our church that was really a great, like a church of Christ. That was really great. He was dispensational. But we got our new pastor here and he won't preach on the second coming because he says it causes issues in the church. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, yeah. oh, and uh, they just want somebody to talk to. Usually it's always older people. Just wanting somebody to talk to. My name is in the Herald of Hope magazine. If you look on the first page, you know, Pastor Rick, my telephone number is there, my mobile number. And I get different telephone calls. People. I don't know how many times that's happened to me. Churches who left. You got John E. Cobb and, and Peter Jackson and then for years there was, I won't tell you the name of a church, but they used to preach at this one church down Mandurah away for years having her, uh, second coming conferences. <clears throat> and just a few years ago, I called them up. About 18, it would be about 2018, they were coming over to do some preaching in churches for conferences through the state. And I uh, called up and say, I mean, nobody from that church had called me. But they had called and said, well, we have a new pastor and he handles anything to do with, past, with prophecy in the church. So we won't be needing the Herald of Hope speakers. <laughs> okay. So she didn't say directly, the receptionist of the church, that uh, he was a male. But, you know, he's going to handle all of that. So do you think he probably is? New pastors come in. You know, the old dispensational fellow is gone. Okay. Uh, this is how, you know, you know, what's happening. The Bible, because see, the Bible colleges aren't teaching it. I was, when we were in Adelaide, there was a Bible college there that was a Bible, teaching Bible college for several years. But there was a death in our church and the president or vice president, I forget his title now, of that college came to the funeral service. I did the funeral service. Afterwards, he's speaking to me. And he said it to me. He said, you're probably one of those dispensationalists. I said, yes, I am. I'm with the Herald of Hope Ministry as a rep for them. Uh, I don't do much preaching for them, but I do representation and I help organize conferences and things for them. He said, our college used to be that way. It used to be that way. 
But we used to have, in the president's office, had the whole chart, something like this. He said it was all around the wall, behind the president and around. But we've taken it all down. They took it down. We don't have that anymore. In fact, I said, oh, I hardly said anything to him. In fact, he began to get a little bit uh, in my face. I'll use those words. Because okay? he got right up like this. After that, I'm just listening to him. He, he really had a problem with dispensational doctrine. And then finally, after a few moments, his wife was sitting over here because we were at the reception and his wife after the funeral service. And so the wife came over and said, "Hun, come on now. You need to settle down. And, and so they went and sat down. Okay? I said, wow, man. Truth always makes people get upset, doesn't it? Have you noticed that? Truth always in hearts, one way or another, when God's truth is going forth, either hearts will melt or hearts get hard. And so let me share with you here what I want to show in this picture. As you see here, the law, this was when uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are under the dispensation of the law. Are you aware of that? Though they're in the New Testament, Christ hasn't gone to the cross and risen. And that's why it says Acts 1 here. In Acts chapter 1, when the Holy Spirit comes down, that's when the church gets started. The new dispensation that we are in. And what is it? It's grace, but it was a mystery. But it's the age of grace. It's the age, also we saw often say grace, of the gospel of what? Christ. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's the gospel of Christ. Not the gospel of the kingdom. This is the age that we are in. And here in the seven-year tribulation period, it's going to be preached. This is the 70th week of Daniel. And that being fulfilled, prophesied by Daniel in 926. And when that takes place, yes, that message, because the church will be raptured, will be out of here. Okay? But in the first part here, the Jews were preaching that gospel. And see what it, how it got them in trouble? You know, now who sent the famine? Again, children, who sent the famine? God. And so all these Jews down there, believers down there in Jerusalem and Judea area, man, we, but we've sold everything. We've got it. And a famine's coming. Well, I'll have, I'll have to find some work. I can't go back and work in the field I sold because the famine's <laughs> won't be any work there because the crops won't grow because it's famine time, right? Oh, there'll be no rain and stuff like that. What are we going to do? You mean we got to send some prophets up to Antioch to that, those Gentile church and ask for help from Gentiles? See how God will take, he wants you to grow in the issues that you don't want to face. He'll put you in situations where you have to humble your heart and face your issues. And they're going to have to take gifts from Gentile, Gentile believers that is. Humble their hearts and take Gentile believers. And so God tried through that famine, but when Paul comes back, as we go through Acts, yeah, when Paul's gonna come back after his third missionary and what's gonna happen, we're gonna see that it didn't work very well. God tried it. He's, he's doing all kinds of things. As you study through the Old Testament, you'll see so many times God's mercy was trying to get the children of Israel to repent. We saw that this morning in Malachi, right? He told them, Malachi the prophet. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah, Malachi. Yeah, as he said, yeah. <laughs> as he said there in, in chapter 3, as it comes to the end of it, you know, he tells them, yeah, you're to repent and you're to turn back, basically, you know, and they're saying, turn back, turn, you know, turn, turn from what? They didn't think they were doing wrong. Because, what's the key word? Today we know it's called being inclusive. They didn't know it was what that was back then. But see, they had accepted all the false teaching from so many of the idol worships. They were bringing in the false practices of different idol worship and all of that into their customs and practices. They didn't realize how far they had left God's word. And they were practicing, they were practicing inclusiveness. And this is what happens to, to churches today. Churches that are inclusive have left God's word. You're not standing on what God has said in his word and the simple gospel message. Okay, here we have, again, like you said, Troy, the mystery, the Jewish prophets, they couldn't see this. This was hidden. Ephesians makes it, different passages. Colossians talks about it, how this age, the church age, this age of the gospel of Christ was hidden to the Jews. They didn't understand it because they rejected the Messiah and crucified him. And praise the Lord for his glory. We now have forgiveness. And so they could only see the suffering Messiah. And they could see a reigning Messiah who will set up the kingdom that they look. But they had no idea about the church age. And so again, in this chart here. Here, 
before the rapture or after the rapture, the gospel of the kingdom is going to be preached. Jesus said that in Matthew, go to Matthew chapter 24, I think it's verse 7 or 8. Jesus said this gospel of the kingdom must be preached where? All through the world. All the world will hear the gospel. Again. When will that happen? He's talking about the tribulation period. Again, when God is working through Israel. It was preached here. And it shouldn't have been preached by those early Jewish believers. It should have been the gospel of grace. But they didn't understand the reality of it. And so application. Why are Antioch believers helping on a Judean believers when the famine is a worldwide famine? Won't the Antioch believers need help too? Maybe, but they have been living by the gospel. But they, that's the Antioch believers, have been living by the gospel of Christ. So they have resources to bless others with. See, 1 John 3, 17, we, we prayed that earlier as a prayer. But whoso hath this world's good, okay, so they haven't given it away and sold it, right? And give it to the church. But whoso hath this world's good and seeth his brother have need and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? When God has blessed you, you are to give that. Remember, everything we have is his. My life is his. My breath is his. <laughs> my next breath could be finished. Yeah, I breathe because of his will. Jesus said, without me, you can do what? No. Do nothing. We can do nothing. And so the way that God wants to give us to give is not to give everything away. And young people catch that. You may get a friend who thinks, man, yeah, well, I've seen, I, the reason I emphasize this, I've seen young people go into communes, Christian communes I'm talking about, Christian people. Don't, don't, listen, yeah, if nothing else, pull this away from this message. Oh, preacher said, don't go to a Christian commune. Remember that. Okay, it is not biblical to be in a Christian commune that you have to go to a Christian commune. Yeah, but if you were talking to the communists in my university, they would say, yes, you need to sell everything and, and we serve each other. Okay, yeah, whoever is the one that control among that group, that's who you serve. Okay. So, way believers give to and through their local church. They, here's seven ways of people giving Christians give today. Never give plan, let the world go to hell. So many Christians don't care. Just let the world go to hell. They have no understanding of the reality that hell comes the moment a person dies without Christ. Carelessly, to anything and anything or everything outside the church. Yeah, somebody comes along here, there, or there, they give to it. Impulsively, when emotions are stirred anywhere. So whether it's sitting in a church and you have a missionary talking about a need that they have, oh, okay, I'll give to that. Uh, whether outside somebody comes to them, you know, let the emotions control themselves. People, I'll share with you how many times I get a, uh, uh, a, a message from somebody, me too. Get telephone calls come through and you hear about this need or that. Or you look at TV. Yeah, and the little children are all starving and stuff. Have you seen the ads for sending support to Afghanistan? Yeah, there's, there's uh, anybody seen the commercial? I saw the commercial the other night. I was watching the news and it came on. Commercial for Afghanistan to send support for the orphans in Afghanistan. What's the Taliban doing? It's their country, right? Yeah, it's their country. Taliban now, yeah, yeah. And they're now trying to get the Western world. They want to destroy the Western world, but they want our money to take care of their orphans. Okay. Well, in some ways, you know, some of those orphans were caused by Western world soldiers. So, yeah, I don't, if you want to send money there, that's fine. Okay. But, uh, yeah, so many people, but brothers and sisters, I want to support those. Let me share with you. I want to support those with the funds, the limited funds that I have that can give forth the grace, the gospel of grace. Those are the missionaries we support. Those people who are out there sharing the gospel of grace. And with that, we're supporting orphans in Africa. Once you know, we don't, you know, we support, yeah, we support orphans through a local church that has orphans in Africa in the Congo. Okay, and we're supporting those. Some of those orphans are all, parents have been killed. But we don't hear about the Islamic groups that are going through Africa just killing people. Every now and then it comes through when so many people get killed. But often Islamic groups, when I was in the Congo in 09, yeah, I was traveling with pastors there and we had to be, they, we can't go this area because a, a hospital there has been uh, Islamic and it's always was Muslim. It's an Islamic group. Yeah. Stormed the hospital. 
took all the fun and burned it down. And so many people got killed. Did it make news? No, it didn't make news, but it's going on all the time. Same thing in South America. Whoa, several years ago, I mean, true story, the communists came in again with their bands and stuff like that into a church, okay? Killed most of the people in the church. Communists just going into a country town and a country church, you know, wanting, stealing, taking stuff from them. This goes on all around the world. But we young people, you aren't hearing what's taking place. You have to know missionaries. You have to know. It's like, for instance, the communist China. I was at a conference years ago. And there was a pastor who was going into China. And he got, because he led a Chinese official at the UN to Christ. He stood on the streets of New York. Now, could I stand on the streets of Beijing and pass out gospel tracts? Where would they take me? <laughs> you know, you can't pass out on the steps of Beijing or Shanghai or anywhere and preach and tell people about Jesus, okay? But this gospel preacher was in New York just down from the UN, and he's standing there. I got to meet the guy. He said, I've just been going week after week. I go there, and I pass out tracts, and I stand in the court, and I, and I tell the gospel, share the gospel. And he said, this one Chinaman kept coming by all the time. He said, he, said, and he knew he was coming from the UN. He said, one day he took the track, and about an hour later, he came back and he said, can you come to my apartment? And it was a very nice apartment he went to. It wasn't it just a typical New York little down the street little part? He said, he took me up this big lift in this very nice building up to his apartment. I said, wow, this is very nice. He had a high position in the, in the UN from China. And he said, I've been reading all the material that you've been giving to me. And it wasn't in Chinese, it was in English. So the guy spoke English well. And he said, tell me more. And he came back, had some Bible studies with him. And he said, and he prayed and accepted Christ. And when he went back, was transferred back to China, he said, I will give you a passport. I want you to come and see me after I'm home. He said, okay. And so he gathered some money together. You know, he wasn't a rich fella, just a simple Christian working guy, go in the evenings on the weekends and pass out tracks. He could be helmet, okay? And he went to China. And the guy met him at the airport and took him there. And this was in, uh, what's the capital again? Beijing? Beijing? Yeah, Beijing. Yeah. And he took him into his apartment there. Very nice official. He said, now I'm going to give you a license so you can have a special service. And I got people I want you to talk to. And that started a church in China. But see, this is during when the door opened. What's happened to the door now? Closed. It's closed. And like he said, he said, now, no emails. See, this is, emails were just starting then. Yeah, he said, N nobody can know this. Yeah, this is secret. And he showed us some pictures to us. He showed us yeah, other pastors that were there. He showed some pictures. Uh, they were using the, the, uh, the mo hotels, big hotel store. They were, they were like at the 28th floor or something, one of the big high rises around there. In the background was the big square through the windows because they were baptizing in the bathtub, people who come to Christ. And there is the Tiananmen Square through the windows in the back. Wow. What about, he said, now you don't talk about this. Don't put it on any emails. He said, at this moment in China, there's over 300,000. And the word I want to use is inspectors watching the internet. What goes in and what comes out. Now, a lot has improved since then. They maybe don't have to have 300,000 because now with word recognition and all that, they're watching you know, that way what goes in. But you don't say anything negative about the state, right? Or the persons in China. And so praise the Lord. God got this young man, not young man, he was a middle-aged man, got him in there preaching the gospel. Is this being televised? We're not, okay, you're going to have to cut this out, Azure. Yeah, it's not live. So you're going to have to cut this out. Cut this section out, okay? Okay, okay. Yeah, you, it's so soft. Then when you get paid then, then you give, you say, Lord, I'll give this much to the Lord's work, okay? And then there's by faith sacrificially. Trusting God's grace to provide beyond your, you say, say okay, Lord, yeah, I, I want to give 15% this year. Oh, that's how much I want to give to my local church. And then I'll give special gifts beyond that, okay? A faithful tithe plus faith blessings, okay? So, this is something every Christian has to do is search your heart. You're not joining a commune. You're working for the Lord. I've known people. I heard a, 
uh, a young fellow, not a young fellow, he was middle-aged, but he, uh, as a young fellow, said, Lord, I want to help people around the world. Something like that is prayer. I want to give, give to your work. He just had a passion of wanting to help people. So he's just a, a simple little plasterer. Just a plasterer, a brick, working in all the, you know, the homes and everything, you know, plastering homes over in America. And over there, he used gyp rock, you know, you know, he's gyp rocking homes all the time. And he got, got this work, and he got so much work, he hired another fellow to work with him. And then he said he had another, another I heard him tell his testimony. He hired another fellow to work with him. Soon he had a big crew of guys working. In fact, he got a warehouse and he started buying plasterboard from the factories. When you buy it in big quantities, you get it really cheap, as you would know, you, you tradies. Okay. And he, it just kept growing and growing. It became his business from a tradesman plastering by himself. He became a multi million dollar business. He said, Every time I turned around, God just kept blessing me. Kept blessing me. And the thing was, he got some good tradesmen with him. That's one of the things. Getting guys also that work, that are tradesmen, that know, that want to work. And he became, and he was supporting so much of God's work. R.G. Letourneau is the same way. If you've never, if you've never read the, the book, Mover of Men and Mountains, read the story of R.G. Letourneau. Again, just a little country boy that God made a multi-millionaire. And he used his money for the Lord's work. And every week he went out on visitation. Here's a guy who knocks your door, comes to see you. <gasps> And he's a multi-millionaire, <laughs> okay, to tell you about Jesus. Yeah, he's still, he, he, I never met him, but I knew fellows who met him and went to the University of Eternal College, which used to be a very good Bible college. I don't know what it is now, okay. But this is something to convict your heart with. How are you giving? Because biblical giving in this age of the gospel of Christ, number one, your first requirement is support my pastor. Support you. If you're part of a local church, you need to help the pastor. And the local church ministries. The, salary, the pastor needs a salary. So does also the ministries of the church. You've got to think first of your local church where you're being fed. And as much as possible, all giving is to and through my local church. So look for the needs that are constantly being shared in local church to share with missionaries, particularly overseas. Like we've been sending money and different things to Myanmar. With what's happening over there in Myanmar. Oh man, at different times in the past also to the Congo. And train our children in the fear of God by honoring him with their time. So important, parents, train your children. Our kids, when they were little, right away, when they started getting different gifts and different things, how much are you going to give back to the Lord? Wow, you weren't expecting that. No, well, yeah, yeah. Just train them to tithe, whatever that tithe may be, percentage you have. And fourthly, be prepared for these last days before the rapture. How many of you heard there's going to be an economic collapse? Things are going to collapse. Okay. How bad? We, the news keeps talking about the recession. But even on the basic corporate news, we're talking about the collapse taking place. How bad will the recession be? Okay. How many of you have heard of, is it called Betrix? The new financial group, countries coming together to destroy the, do the dollar. Bricks. Yeah, bricks. Bricks. You heard of it, bricks? You got to start watching what's happening there. Countries of the world, they're going to destroy the U.S. dollar. That's one of the purposes to destroy that. And in the process, there's going to be recession around the world as the new economy takes place. Uh, if you put your money into crypto, you found out you were wrong to do that, right? <laughs> yes, went down. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So, what is, how bad will it be? I don't know. I'm not here to be a fear monger, but looking at the news of what's taking place and what's taking place around us and the economies of the world and looking, you heard Mr. Biden, did you hear Mr. Biden at the big conference, climate conference over in Egypt? He said, definitely America by 2030 will be totally, all of its goals for climate change by 2030. Yeah, that's going to put recession into the country as they continue to do that. He cut off the pipeline from, from Alaska down there in the oil when he became president two years ago. The key to our, my, our son is in gas and oil, okay? It wasn't a happy company. They had like 1,600 employees. He's in the big office in Tulsa, Oklahoma, big tall building. And when President Biden stopped the Keystone pipeline of all that energy coming down, 
man, it was, going to the office was hard because nobody was happy. <laughs> gas, they were in gas and oil, the company is, okay? Oh, the energy sources. There's, there is a concerted effort of the enemy of destroying the world's economies, particularly Western economies, and making one world economy. If you're not aware of that, you need to start thinking. Yeah. You know, the big thing from the World Economic Forum is you're going to own nothing, but you're going to be what? Happy. Happy. <laughs> okay. So, as Christians, we need to, as a church, prepare. As Christians, individually, let me share with you. Young people, have you bought yourself, you know, how much money do you owe? One thing I'll take away with this. Get yourself debt free. Get yourself out of debt. You heard it from the pulpit. Yeah, the scripture says, oh, no, man, what? Anything. And right now I'm going to tell you, this is the time you don't want to be in debt. If you've got debts out there, pay those debts off as quick as you possibly can. Somebody raising their hand? Okay, I thought somebody, you know, Cody probably. You in debt, Cody? <laughs> yeah, you didn't even know what the word means. <laughs> okay. Yeah. But if you're in debt, get out. So, guys, if you bought yourself some new cars, pay them off quick, you know. You may wake up one day and you got no money in your bank account. Now people, oh, that will never happen. It has happened. People already, it's happened to them. And look at history. I know they don't teach history like they used to. But then when the depressions hit, that's what happens. That's why people in the 1920s were throwing themselves out of buildings because they woke up one morning and they had what? Nothing. So out the window they went. They couldn't handle it. People, history always repeats itself because man is sinner and the sins of mankind are always recycling itself. Be ready. Be ready. And I understand, you know, I've been given a, a DVD here that Herbert gave to Alex and Sam, yeah, about what's happening. Yeah, so young people especially, listen to me. Don't go into debt. Now's not the time to go into debt. Save your money. Give to the Lord as the Lord shares impresses upon you what to give, but be aware of what's taking place around this world. And remember, <clears throat> but this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also spirit. And he which soweth bountifully shall also reap bountifully. Every man according as he purposed in his heart, so let him give. Not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a what? A cheerful giver. So give. Give as the Lord leads you and give it from a heart of cheerfulness. And if you become aware of what's happening around the world, oh yeah, you know you're giving to help others too. And God is able to make all grace abound towards you. Remember that. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the truth of God's word to us this morning. And Lord, we thank you we're still in this age of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Oh, Lord, this marvelous good news that our Savior went to the cross, bore our sins in his own body, as the scripture says. And then he died. But he had covered those sins with his own precious blood. And oh, we thank you so much. And he rose then on the third day. And so we have a loving Savior who cares for us and wants us to be ministering that grace, that gospel of grace of Christ before a world that is so confused, so lost, without purpose, wandering in darkness. And Lord, but we live in the light, the light of Christ. And may we be truly aware, may we not have our heads in the sand, aware of the times that we live in, and be, Father, Christians who are ready to minister and to give when needed. Because, Father... We've been astute in putting away of having preparation for what's coming. Just as what you did with Joseph in Egypt, how they stored away for those seven years of famine. Oh, Lord, convict us to not let what's coming catch us off guard. But may we be ready, Father, to be a witness and a testimony for you. And if there's someone here this morning without Jesus Christ as their Savior, we pray this morning's message has touched them and that they see that they're sinners and they need to know Jesus as their Savior. May they receive him, we pray, and we ask it in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.